and movies have immortalized this city quite often dubbed the intellectual capital. The birthplace of modern literary and artistic thought, Kolkata offers its visitors and lovers charm and intellect. It has always been a city where um, the written word, um, thinking, thinking people, thoughts, creativity, painting, music, the arts have been celebrated in the best possible way. In part one of the series on the Kolkata Literary Festival, we saw the changing cinema scope of Indian cinema, the fast evolving face of theatre and art and all that embodies the beautiful city of Kolkata. Who could take all this at our age, Manto Bhai? What use are tears? I don't care for them anymore. In this episode, you'll witness the literary side of the city. What makes Kolkata tick as a cultural hub and is it still correct to label it India's intellectual capital? Organized by the APJ Surindra Group and the Oxford Bookstore, the 4th APJ Kolkata Literary Festival spanning over five days brought together writers, filmmakers, artists and thought leaders from all across the arena. The five days of literature and art in the rich Kolkata winter saw the city immerse itself in art, literature, culture and heritage. It just for me symbolized uh, how um, a literary fest can get it right by getting the perspectives right from the word go. Here it was uh, focused, it was serious, it was apt. I'm really enjoying the, the literature festival. I think that Jaipur is the famous one, but I've been really impressed by the different kinds of discussions we've had. So we haven't just talked about literature, we've also talked about film, art, different cultural contexts and with a very high level of contributions. Literature festivals are excellent. You know, it brings together writers, you know, cartoonists, you know, dramatists uh, to speak about you know, what's happening in a country, in a society in a fairly large and, and diverse way. You know, obviously sometimes politics is a bit too narrow and here the, the larger picture, the aspirations of the people can be expressed. Patichitra is one of the earliest forms of popular art and exists even today. Pats or scroll paintings are narrative stories based on religious or moral themes for the entertainment of the village folk. Adding local flavour to the literary fest was Patichitra artist Guru Pada Chitrakar, who displayed his take on the fest. মানে অ্যাকচুয়ালি আমি কিন্তু মেদিনীপুরের জোড়ানো পটচিত্র বানাই এটা আমাদের বংশ পরম্পরা হয়ে আসছে আমার বাবা তার বাবা তার বাবা মানে পরের পর হয়েই আসছে আমাদের তো সেদিক থেকে আমি পৌরাণিক পটের বিষয় পরে রামায়ণ মহাভারত মঙ্গল কাব্য মঙ্গল চন্ডী এগুলো নিয়ে কাজ করি সাথে সাথে সোশ্যাল ওয়ার্ক হেলথ নিয়ে প্রাকৃতিক দুর্যোগ নিয়ে ওয়ার্ল্ড ট্রেড সেন্টার যে ভাঙা হয়েছিল সেটা নিয়ে করেছি সুনামির পর আমি একটা কোনো আমার চোখের সামনে যদি কিছু একটা খুব ভালো ইয়ে আসে সেটাকে আমি নিজে মতো করে বানাই Of feminism with a, with a, a knife in the, you know, in the teeth. Has the ruling class changed? Not at all. The elements are still there. Sarojini 
नायडू कमला दास शशि देश पांडे अनिता देसाई Despite such illustrious names in the literary arena, women writers in India are often undervalued, often because of patriarchal assumptions. At the time when Isma Chuktai wrote and the time when Kamla Das was writing for example, uh, Taslima I wouldn't even count in the same category uh, at all. Uh, uh, they were saying something which was deeply personal. It was more a personal voice. It was a personal cry for freedom. And then, of course, it had echoes which touched the lives of thousands of women and men. I hope gender has been addressed uh, unevenly, uh, both in Indian literature and in Indian cinema, which has so much affected our consciousness. So sometimes we have the strong, aggressive woman who is uh, killing her rapist, like in Insaf Ka Tarazu, and at other times we'll have the demure Bahu who is doing. puja and looking after her husband and her family and her in-laws as the role model but uh, in terms of a normal woman who has feelings who's an individual who's not a mother a girlfriend a daughter uh, there is less and less spaces and those spaces seem to be shrinking and becoming more conservative set in the beautiful landscape of the national library at kolkata a power packed discussion led by french writer kenise murad brought out issues faced by asian women in expressing emotions identity and creativity and its subsequent consequence in their writing a journalist reporting on the uh, war reporter and journalist in all the i can see when i'm looking at the class i see the boys kind of you know you see that little bug going off going on rather about their heads it is a surprising when kenize murad a celebrated french turkish writer with indian roots attributes her writing and stories to her background and her life taking advantage of her fascinating lineage she believes her writing can act as a confluence between the west and the east writing first as a journalist for 15 years then i became a writing writing historical novel mostly because i wanted to convey a few things that i believed in it was the ideas of more well, tolerance between different culture different religion and to explain to the west what they did not understand about the east so i'm trying i'm a little link i'm trying to be a little link between these two worlds who don't don't know each other well or have prejudice especially of course towards the muslim world but towards the oriental world often also and so i wanted to try to to fight these prejudices which uh, are leading to violence and to wars you know one cannot uh, wars are always prepared by propaganda which shows the other as evil and all violence also are prepared by this propaganda if you see those as evil of course you want to destroy him if you see that he is like you you are not going to go and fight him a sex trafficking abolitionist journalist and an activist ruchira gupta has worked endlessly for over 25 years to put a curb on sex trafficking and prostitution in the country ruchira feels that society has a great influence over media and literature and literature merely mirrors the reality of the civilized and the uncivilized state we live in yeah, it's it's a function of society influencing media so society influencing books and movies and tv so uh, because uh, society itself is becoming more conservative so we are you know what tv is depicting is that more conservative society that is one thing but it's also of course the other way around the tv influences us or right books influence us or cinema influences us but we also influence books uh, cinema and tv so i think it's like a catch 22 we've sort of gone into and uh, many women and girls uh, have begun to feel it's safer to stick to the old conservative values uh, because they have seen a whole generation of women post independence who are single who are independent uh, who had fantastic jobs as uh, heads of departments in universities as writers as lawyers as activists and uh, but they did not have um, you know the fun of family life as they see it so there has been the daughters have wanted it all they wanted the family life they wanted husbands and children and all of that along with the independence but they haven't been able to negotiate that so what has happened is actually they've just got the family life 
with all its limitations without having the independence uh, to be able to negotiate and fulfill their full potential themselves and uh, i think media is depicting that and influencing that a critic broadcaster and writer bidisha talked about stereotypes and breaking them i'm extremely disturbed at Western audiences' expectations of Asian and particularly Indian subcontinental artwork because I suspect that those audiences like the work which um, somehow comforts their stereotypes. So they like, they like films and books about oppressed women and uh, the fight between Hindus and Muslims and they like, they like fairy tales like Slumdog Millionaire and they like to hear about children living under railway tracks. And all I would say is that at least there's a movement on the behalf of second generation British Asians, which is, I am one of, to try to counteract those kinds of cliches, because we too find it extremely limiting. You know, it's always about forbidden love, it's always about class or poverty, and we're, we're trying very hard to get away from those ideas, because they're stereotypes. Shobha De, one of India's eccentric women writers, choosing the platform to launch her latest book, Setji, talks about women writers, emancipation and the right to voice. We need to look at a lot of things and right now there is a heightened uh, awareness, especially amongst the women of India who after centuries have found a voice. Now this is a voice if we stifle it at this stage will be doing not just a grave injustice to the women of our country but to humanity it's not just about sexuality you know unfortunately we are confusing issues we think emancipation means uh, you can turn into uh, a sexual predator and that's what emancipation is all about it is not that it's about uh, just your basic human rights it's about your dignity it's about uh, opportunities it's about choices and somewhere, yes, we are losing the plot and we are only equating uh, a certain kind of freedom and emancipation with sexual freedom. That's not how it is. In order to encourage emerging, unrecognized talent of South Asian origin, Tibor Jones and Associates in the second year of the prize welcomed entries of manuscripts of unpublished draft of a full-length novel. With over a hundred entries, the panel was baffled with the response they received and choosing the winner was a tough choice. His standard suggestion was lots of sleep and exercise. For that reason, everyone in the ashram thought of him as an excellent doctor. I stared at my mother's naked back and ran a comforting hand over it. The winner of the 2013 Tibor Jones South Asia was Avni Doshi for her manuscript Girl in White Cotton. The prize includes rupees 1 lakh and literary representation by Tibor Jones and Associates, a leading London literary agency. Actually, I started writing a poem and I just, it just kept growing. There were just more words and it soon became a short story and then it turned into a novel. But uh, I think I was inspired a lot by my mom's childhood growing up in Pune, by a lot of my mom's family living in India. And um, there were just a lot of stories I wanted to tell. In those we were looking for the things that one normally looks at. Uh, that is how well written it was, what the storyline was, what the plot and characterization was, what kind of potential it had as an unusual story and what kind of courage the writer had to write something different. There's no one particular thing because every book has different strengths and, and weaknesses but essentially you're looking for uh, a good storyteller. Writers are eventually storytellers and to tell a story well you have to know the world of that story. You have to be confident within that world. Um, so how well does the writer create that world? A man's intellect is a testament to his thirst for knowledge and books, big or small, are the biggest treasure trove of information. I am reading uh, From Dongri to Dubai uh, by Hussein Zaidi. It's a history of the Mumbai Mafia. It's a non-fiction book. And it's beautifully uh, researched and some great stories in it. A novel that we published called The Song Seekers by, oddly enough, a Bengali writer uh, called Shashwati Sen Gupta. A very interesting historical biography of Elizabeth I. I'm reading a book recently which I found very important that everybody should read, especially, you know, the young people. 
It's a book written by a Lebanese writer who lives in France. It's called Amin Malouf. It's been on my shelves for a long while, which is Louis Bunuel's uh, biography called My Last Breath. There is a war about the start. The Shah of Iran wants to recapture Herat. A fact that needs to be rediscovered in the context of a talk that tries to argue that Gandhi was an Asian, not just an Indian. Kolkata, rich in heritage and history, has always been a fascination for historians. Several artists, writers and filmmakers have often tried to capture their city in their works. But no one coming close to depicting the wild child that the city truly is. There is a war about to start. The Shah of Iran wants to recapture Herat on the Afghan border. As a result, the officer has been able to change, hasn't been able to change his horse at any point in the journey. And so for five days and for five nights, he's been riding the same mount. And this night, in the dark, without a moon, he gets lost. William Dalrymple's perceptive account of the first British invasion of Afghanistan in his latest book, Return of a King, mirroring the invasion a century and a half later, is a lesson in history and the need to learn from it. I think the Indian biographical tradition is still in its infancy. You're not getting these great tomb-stopping four-volume uh, biographies of, um, of major political figures here it, coming out regularly in the way you do in America and Britain. I mean, they're beginning. Ram Guha himself is working on a, on a two-volume history of Gandhi. There is a, a volume on Nehru being prepared by Sunil Kilnani. Ananya Vajpayee has, has just begun work on uh, Ambedkar. But uh, in, in, it's true to say that at the moment, there isn't the same, the bestseller list certainly, and the prize list are not full works of history and biography, in a way they should be. I think India is in the grip of a, uh, of a literary renaissance. It, the, the, the field is changing, there's no doubt. The extraordinary generation of Amitav Ghosh, Salman Rushdie, Vikram Set, who are now in their 50s, have not had successors of the same stature, I think it's fair to say in this country, that the current crop of younger writers aren't yet in their stride in the same way. I mean, where you're getting extraordinary fiction is in Pakistan. And I think, you know, Mohsen Hamid, Daniel Moinuddin, those two are an A-team of the same stature as Rushdie, Ghosh and Set. Setting in context, history and politics in the modern time was Ramachandra Guha with his take on what kind of an Asian was Gandhi. Among Gandhians and Gandhi scholars, this is very well known. The significance of 9 September 1906 as being uh, marked as the birth of Satyagraha, it's extremely well known. But I want to, what I want to focus on now is on one aspect of that meeting in the Empire Theatre that has been forgotten. A fact that needs to be rediscovered in the context of a talk that tries to argue that Gandhi was an Asian, not just an Indian. And this is that in that crowd in the Transvaal Theatre were very many Chinese. For the Asiatic Act of the Transvaal government discriminated against the Chinese too. It was not an Indian Act, it was an Asiatic Act. Another of Gandhi's very close friends, a Jewish radical called Henry Pollack, said that this Satyagraha shows that the 15,000 Asiatics in the Transvaal are fighting a race fight which is of the utmost importance for the whole world. And this struggle is whether the Asiatic people were eternally to be kept in subjection or treated on terms of equality. Whether the Asiatic people were to be regarded as fellow men, as fellow human beings, to be treated as men to men and not as men to slaves.
five days, 70 speakers and a city that simply loves its art, culture and books. The festival was a confluence of mind, matter, music, film, theatre and art. The fourth edition of the APJ Kolkata Literary Festival saw artists, writers, filmmakers and thought leaders from all walks of life come together and celebrate the spirit of a city that has long been the art capital of the country.